Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. We're going to be looking at the king denied in verses 69 through 75. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that it's easy for some people to deny you. And for some, it's very, very difficult. And that, Lord, when two or more people gather together and then they collectively deny you, that things get even more problematic. Lord, we thank you that you're in the business of taking our failure and taking our problems and taking our inconsistencies and finding a way to forgive us and finding a way to restore us and finding a way to reconcile us to yourself. And so, Heavenly Father, again, as we look at this difficult passage of Scripture, that our hearts would be reminded and filled with joy that you find a way to take our mistakes and glorify yourself. And so, Lord, we commit this time to you and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 69, it says, Now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I don't know what you're saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth, but again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you also are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know. Know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. When a plane crashes, it makes news. Years ago, flight number 52 of Avianca Airlines departed Medellin, Colombia, and was headed for Kennedy International Airport. Just 15 minutes before the plane came to its destination, it crashed, killing 73 passengers and injuring many more. One of the men on board was taken to a local hospital. His name was Jorge, and later he was interviewed on national news, and he wept into the camera. He sobbed, not because the plane crashed, not because people died, but because he was caught. Something else crashed that day, his reputation. Jorge was a drug mule, a carrier of cocaine. They took him from the crash site to the hospital and they x-rayed his body and they found a balloon that was over 18 inches long in his abdomen and it was filled with cocaine powder. Jorge wasn't your typical drug mule. This was his first excursion into the underbelly of organized crime and in his hometown, Jorge Jorge was, was, was considered a kind of a role model. He was noted in that place for decency and honor. He was admired and respected. There's a problem when your character crashes. Can you imagine having a jail named after you and then you find yourself in that jail? Can you imagine developing a reputation for fidelity bravery, integrity, only to lose it by inconsistency and deceit. 
Here, Matthew is going to record the crash of Peter's character. And Peter's version of the story, by the way, is found in Mark's gospel, chapter 14, verses 66 through 72. Luke and John also record the event. So as I was preparing this study, I kept saying to myself, why do you suppose the gospels commit so much time to Peter's story? And I'm going to suggest to you that the reason why so much attention is given to this story and the Holy Spirit draws so much attention to this story is because in many ways, Peter's story is our story. Peter's mistake is going to make big news. And as we piece together Peter's story, we know that in his ministry, it is this incredible contrast between great failure and great success, we find him in Christ's inner circle. We find him an eyewitness to miracles that are reported in the New Testament. We hear Jesus predict the betrayal of Judas and the denial of Peter. And we've come to learn that when Jesus predicts that something is going to happen, you already know the answer. It happens. It happens. It's interesting, again, the king is on trial in the palace. Peter is on trial outside of the palace. So there's a trial taking place in the inside and there's a trial taking place in the outside. One is a court and one is a courtyard. Inside, Jesus is telling the Jewish Supreme Court that he's the son of God, that he's the promised Messiah. And for Peter... Normally brash, normally forward, normally aggressive. He's going to deny that he even knows him. And for Peter, this event is going to serve as a life-changing event. He is going to be forever marked by this story. You see... Caiaphas may have hated Jesus. Herod may have been curious about Jesus. Pilate may have been indifferent to Jesus. The crowds may have been fickle about Jesus. But what purpose does the denial of Peter serve? Again, in a very real sense, it tells us a story about what we want. You see, Peter is a true believer. Peter wants to remain true. Peter wants to remain faithful. He wants to remain loyal. He wants to remain committed. So what is going on and what can we learn? Peter's fall, in one sense, is the groundwork for all defection. It's a pattern of denial that seems common when we attempt to follow Jesus in our own strength, in our own resources, with our own power, with our own emotion. People don't usually fall into sin. We walk into sin one step at a time. And again, as we've been following along in this gospel, what are the steps that has led to this catastrophic moment in his life? You'll remember, number one, that Peter began to depend on his own carnal resources rather than the resources of God. Remember what we learned earlier in the chapter in verse 33. Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Do you remember what we sang? You're never going to let, never going to let me down. Can you imagine if we change the words? I'm never going to let, I'm never going to let you, you down. Nobody wants to sing that song. We have to be careful if we make that kind of proud boast. Peter says, even if all are made to stumble, I'm never going to let, never going to let you down. Others can tune out. Others can drop out. Others can cop out. But not me. We need to be careful. God 
resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. And you'll remember that Peter was sleeping when he should have been praying. Remember verse 40? Then he came to the disciples. He found them asleep and he said to Peter, What could you not watch with me for one hour? And we link the two thoughts together that pride and prayerlessness is an invitation to disaster. Pride and prayerlessness go hand in hand. Pride says, I can. Prayer says, I can't. I need your help. We're filled with pride when we think in the power of our own flesh and our own talent and our own gifts and our own resources that we can just simply make things happen for Jesus. And then we find reasons not to prayer, pray. Prayer isn't just simply a tool. To ask for things from God. It's a powerful resource for preparation and for protection and for power. And that's why, again, we're inviting you as a church and us as a family to begin to think a little bit more carefully about if we are going to ask for God's favor and God's blessing and God's anointing, if we want prayer and protection and preparation, we're going to have to ask God to give it to us. God in part provides a remedy for our pride. We pray in humility, believing, trusting, accepting his will. When we pray, we allow God to act in our lives, not from our own resources, but from his resources. So we need to wake up and start praying. And do you remember the episode when Peter attempted to kill Malchus instead of he wound up cutting off his ear. And so Jesus corrects Peter's mistake by healing the servant of the, the high priest. And I make, make no mistake about it. The servant of the high priest is probably inside. But he could just as easily make him, his way outside and say, aren't you the guy who cut off my ear? And so, number four, do you remember that Peter began to follow from a distance in verse 58? And so think about it. Pride, prayerlessness, distance. These all begin to add up and it wears away at your resolve. Peter doesn't fall away. He drifts away. And number five, Peter's warming himself now by the enemy's fire. And in Luke 55, it says, Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat with them. Distance leads to detachment. Maybe you've thought, I'm feeling a little cold. Maybe I'm going to go and I'm going to warm myself at the fires of false fellowship. I'm going to go back to the bar. I'm going to go back to the party scene. I, you know what? I think I'm going to warm myself by the fire of my false friends. Well, maybe I can witness to them. I'm going to suggest something to you. Maybe God will provide an opportunity for you to witness to them. But guess what? You will never, no, never, no, ever, ever, ever be happy with one part of your life in the world and your other part of your life in Christ. You need to be in or out. Some of us have just enough of the world to be miserable in Jesus and we have just enough of Jesus to be miserable in the world. And so like my friend Greg Laurie says, you become a mugwump. Your mug is on one side of the fence. Your wump is on the other. And there's nothing, there's nothing more miserable than a carnal and a conflicted Christian. And so in verse 69, it says, Peter sat outside the courtyard and a servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. Remember, he's being tried on the inside. Peter's being tested on the outside. The courtyards are attached to one another. And Peter sat, it says, outside. Denial doesn't begin when we sit with the crowd. 
He's been linking together a series of events and he's made the decision to sit in a place where he doesn't belong. We see here a picture of the Christ rejectors. Where is he? He's with the people not who accept Christ, but who reject Christ. This isn't the place where Peter belongs. This is the moment of crisis. In Peter's mind, he may have been thinking, well, look, I want to be close to Jesus. Look, I want to know what happens. Look, I want to know how it's going to all work out. Where does Peter belong at this moment in his life? Should it be with the other disciples? Should it be by himself? Should he be praying and pleading with the Lord? The answers and understanding that you're looking for aren't going to be found in the people who hate God and hate Jesus. I'm going to go to school and find out what's real. Well, guess what? I'm not against education and I'm not against going to school. But if you look to this world for the satisfying answers to all of the questions in your life and you go, you know what? I'm going to go to the God haters and the Jesus haters to find out what's true. Is that the best place for you? And by the way, the moment the little voice inside of you says, I don't belong here. You should listen to that little voice. I heard that little voice. (laughs) When are we most likely to deny Jesus? When we turn away from him and desert him, verse 66. When we follow from afar, verse 58. When we follow Jesus, but not too closely. And then when we sit down with the unbelieving crowd. The servant girl comes to him and says, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. Pause. If you're with Jesus... People are going to notice. Didn't I see you at that rally where you said that you believed in life? Didn't I see you at church? Didn't I see you at that Christian conference? Didn't I see you at church? Didn't, didn't, aren't you that person who used to go to Calvary Chapel? Wait a minute. I thought you were a Christian. Didn't you used to be a Christian? What are you doing in this place? Why are you in this bar? What in the world are you doing at this internet site? People who are with Jesus will be seen by others. You know, you meet and you greet each other and you look at one another, but maybe not too long. When you've been with Jesus, people have a certain expectation. They expect you to act like a Christian. If you find yourself in a place dedicated to rejecting Jesus, don't be surprised if someone calls you out. In verse 70, look what it says. But he denied it before them all, saying, I don't know what you're saying. Peter denies it. The casual comment by a servant girl causes Peter to deny it. Look what it says, before them all. Is this some sort of careless outburst? Is this a slip of the tongue? Is this a comment made from fear or cowardice? And again, look at the source of denial. He denied him in front of an army. No. She pulled a gun on him. No. She pulled a sword on him. It's a servant girl. Isn't it interesting that our denial can come from the least likely source? Have you fallen into temptation from what started out and seemed like an innocent relationship? The first denial is a kind of a pretense. Peter pretends not to know what she's talking about. Kurt Vonnegut famously said, we are what we pretend to be, so we must be careful about what we pretend to be. It's possible for a person to pretend to be a Christian 
And it's possible for a Christian to pretend not to be. There doesn't seem to be any immediate danger. There doesn't seem to be any immediate threat to Peter. But he pretends not to know Jesus. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man brings a snare. But he who puts his trust in the Lord will be safe. And so those are the choices. We're going to put our trust in the Lord or we're not going to put our trust in the Lord. We're going to be afraid of what people think or we're not going to be afraid of what people think. In Mark 8, 38, Jesus said, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the son of man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with his holy angels. I'm glad that Jesus said, for whoever is ashamed of me and my words. He didn't just say, if you're ashamed of me. He said, if you're ashamed of me and you're ashamed of what I have to say about God, about sin, about the problem that we face. Abraham lost in part his faith when he went down to Egypt instead of Trusting God in Genesis chapter 12, verse 10. Moses was denied entrance into the promised land because instead of obeying God and refute to just simply speaking to the rock, he struck the rock in anger. Samson lost power when he allowed Delilah to seduce him in Judges 16. David lost joy by giving into the lust of his flesh in Psalm 51, 12. Lot lost everything that he had when he decided to take his family and live in Sodom in Genesis chapter 13. The Ephesians lost their joy and when they left their first love. Peter lost his testimony through cowardice. And look at the second denial in verses 71 and 72. And when he had gone out to the gateway, remember he's in the courtyard sitting by the fire. When he goes out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to him and said to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know. Look at what it says and and understand what it says. I do not know the man. He can't even bring himself to say his name out loud. He can't form the words Jesus on his lips. And he now says, instead of saying, you're the Christ, the son of the living God, he says, I don't even know who this is. He gets up and he walks towards the gateway. What's interesting for me is I began to think is, I wonder how much time elapsed between the first denial and the second denial. Was it a minute? Was it five minutes? Was it 10 minutes? Was it an hour? The time between the denials must have given Peter this momentary sense of relief. The first outburst was a mistake. This was a tragedy. I'm not going to let it happen again. The second is a calculated statement. Peter moves away from the fire. Things get a little colder very quickly. And as he leaves the fire and the warmth of the fire, he also is this chilling effect inside of his heart. And sin has that that effect on us. Our hearts get a little colder and then our hearts get a little harder. And every time we say yes to sin and we say no to Jesus, There's this cold front that forms on the surface of our soul. Just give in, the quiet voice whispers. Who cares? You've already made your bed. Lie in it. Inside the palace, people are spitting and pummeling the face of Jesus inside. They've already put a bag over his head. Inside, they're already striking his face with their fists. Inside, 
He is being tortured. Tell us if you can. Prophesy who it is who's hitting you. Inside, they're begging Jesus to prophesy. Outside, Peter's already fulfilling a prophecy that's coming true in his life. Peter caves in with an oath. The denial is strong and emphatic. I swear to God, I don't know this man. I don't know anything about him. The first denial takes place in front of a person. The second denial takes place in front of a crowd. It would appear that the fear begins to escalate and then it becomes overwhelming. In verse 71, the charge is, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. And the charge is true. Peter had been with Jesus. Peter was the supposed leader of the apostles. Peter revealed that Jesus was the Christ. Peter swore loyalty even if it meant death in verses 33 through 35 of the chapter. This pretense morphs into a form of apostasy. This denial is strengthened by an oath. Peter downgrades Messiah to the man. And again, just for a moment, enter into his mind. What's going on inside of his head? What is going on inside of his mind? Are his thoughts flush with shame, embarrassment, ridicule, the threat of arrest or death? Whatever is going on in his mind, he says, I swear to God, I don't know this man. Paul, writing from prison, exhorted his readers in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8, while he lay rotting in a Roman prison, awaiting execution, writes, quote, therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. And don't be ashamed of me. If I get in trouble, not for doing what's wrong, but for what's doing what's right. If I get in trouble for doing what's wrong, by all means, be ashamed of me. In the first denial, Peter's threatened by a single girl. In the second denial, he feels threatened by the crowd. And the stronger the threat is, the stronger the denial. Do you understand that? The greater the threat, the greater the fear, the more intense it becomes. And so when the crowd threatens, when the crowd ridicules, when the crowd embarrasses, when the crowd abuses, that's a whole different level. I think this is one of the dangers of social media. It's one thing for one person to think you're a jerk, but all of your friends on Facebook? Peter isn't simply an innocent bystander in the story of Jesus. Peter plays a central role. And again, if you pause in the text and you just for a moment, just take a deep breath and say, how did all of this happen? Peter knows Jesus. Peter trusted Jesus. You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Peter didn't witness one miracle or even 10 miracles or even a dozen miracle. I'm going to suggest to you that he witnessed maybe hundreds of miracles. Peter briefly walks on water and now he runs for the shadows. He is the picture of a compromised disciple. This is you and me. If we think our present relationship or our past achievement will somehow keep us free from the threat of compromise, Peter will face a crowd and a sword, but somehow collapses in the face of a girl with a question. Don't be fooled. Again, you can't. You can't serve Jesus in the power of your own will, in your own strength, in your own resolve. It's going to require humility. 
and dependence and fellowship and relationship. And look at the third denial. A little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you're one of them for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crows. And Peter remembers the word of Jesus who had said to him, behold, or before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went and wept bitterly. Now comes the third and the virulent denial. Luke's gospel adds in Luke twenty two fifty nine. 59. Then after about an hour passed. Luke tells us that the time between the second and the third denial is about an hour. I'm going to suggest to you that that hour must have seemed like an eternity to Peter. Tick, talk, tick, talk. The weight is beginning to settle on the surface of his soul. Surely you're also one of them, for your speech betrays you. You know what that means? It sounds to me like you have a Galilean twang. Now, again, we're familiar with regional dialects. You know, imagine if you had to say the city like the people who are from the city. If you're from New York, you say New York. If you're from Philadelphia, you say Philadelphia. And uh, if you're from Boston, Massachusetts, you say Boston. You hear these dialects. It's my understanding that certain people said that, that the Galilean burr was so incredible that Galileans weren't allowed to give the benediction in the synagogue. It's their way of saying, look, we know you're from the Galilee. Your speech betrays you. To deny that you're from Galilee or, and you don't know the most famous Galilean in the world is preposterous. It would be like saying, you're from Arkansas and you've never heard of me. <laughs> well, I'm the most famous person who's ever been in Arkansas. Yeah, you go, how can you be from Arkansas and not know that voice? How can you be from Littleton, Colorado and not know about Columbine? How can you be from Gettysburg and not have ever heard of the Civil War? It doesn't make sense. And could it be that the Galilean accent of Jesus made even some of his speech difficult to understand? Isaiah said in 53 too, he has no form or comeliness that we should look on him and no beauty that we should desire him. And don't be confused by that expression, curse and swear. This isn't cussing. This isn't the salty talk of a sailor who just lets it all out. In verse 74, Peter is invoking a curse on all liars. The swear here is a specific kind of oath. He's inviting God to kill him if he's not telling the truth. Now again, think of the journey. Just a few hours earlier, Peter swore undying love and loyalty. This from the, the disciple who said, I'm never going to leave you. I will die first. Again, past accomplishment won't save you from current temptation. Peter's oath is the most serious taking in vain of the name of God, I suspect, in the New Testament. He's in effect saying, may God kill me. And damn me forever if I am not telling you the truth. For a moment, Peter seems to have lost all sense of God and reality. 
sin and fear can do strange things and terrible things and horrible things. And I am fairly certain that the moment that Peter uttered these words, he fully expected to never, no, ever, no, never, ever, ever, ever to be forgiven. Have you ever heard someone say quietly, maybe in a very loud voice or even in a soft voice, I think I'm going to go to hell for this? That's exactly what he's saying. And the voice inside our head screams, Look at what you've done. Look at what you've become. You know, God understands a slip of the tongue. He understands a meaningless mistake. He understands an outburst of anger in the heat of the moment. But look at this. Look at what you've done. Look at how low you've, you've gone. God can't forgive you. And believe it or not, this is the reason why both Peter and the Holy Spirit want you to know this story. Because Peter wants you to know that there's a way back from doing the impossible and what seems like the unforgivable. In Mark's gospel, Peter told Mark in chapter 14, verse 72, a second time the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the words that Jesus had said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. Luke's gospel says, and the Lord turned and then looked at Peter. The word look, look that's translated there is gazed specifically, purposely, even longingly. Peter's allowing the depths of his own sin and denial to be a magnet of the love of God and Jesus's forgiveness. Does Peter thrill at the horrible and terrible incident? I'm going to suggest to you no. Does Peter appreciate the whole world knowing about his failure? I don't think so. But I'm sure that he got a thrill out of repeating the story. Why I did this. I denied him. And you know what he did? He looked at me. He died in my place. He left and went to Calvary's cross he loved me. He forgave me. He restored me. When they took the bag off of his head, his eyes swollen shut from the vicious beating, he managed to open his eyes long enough to look at me. I did this. I denied him. And he loved me, and he forgave me, and he restored me. And if he could do this for me, he can do this for you. Peter's failure confirmed God's word. Peter's shame is going to spotlight the glory of Jesus. Peter's cowardice is going to make the courage of Jesus even more spectacular. And this may have been the worst night in Peter's life. He felt awful. He made a mistake. He experienced a failure so profound that it seemed unforgivable. And he must have thought that the pain would never go away. Healing often takes a very, very long time. But in the end, Peter's story is going to end with forgiveness and restoration. Peter's denial is going to lead to Peter's repentance. And I want you to think for a moment. There were three steps in his response. Rem look what it says. He remembered the words of Jesus. It would appear that when the rooster crowed, the Lord standing in the chamber of the palace caught Peter's eye and eye to eye, he's remembering the words of Jesus and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you. He wants to sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you that you fail not. And when you're converted, strengthen your brethren. 
Can you imagine? I've prayed for you. I've anticipated that this is going to happen. I'm going to find a way to bring you back to me. And number two, he got alone. He left the courtyard. It says he went out, verse 75. He left as quickly and as safely as he could so he could be alone with God. He is broken. He is filled with pain and anguish and godly sorrow for having failed the Lord. He weeps bitterly. Spurgeon famously said, that once a person's crime is known, that his repentance should be at least as notorious as his crime. Peter failed him. And remorse isn't going to be the final word. Jesus is going to offer strength and power to live again. You see, it isn't just in the tears that he's crying. It's in the reality of knowing that there is a way back. Jesus is still in the business of miracles. And number three, Peter's godly sorrow and repentance is going to lead to the return to the Lord. Judas is sorry that he betrays Jesus, but he's going to go and hang himself. Peter is sorry that he denies Jesus, but he's going to go back to Jesus. You see, regret and remorse that winds up you hurting yourself or hurting others, that's not repentance. Real repentance is you return to Jesus. You go back to him. Years later, Peter is going to help us combat denial by reminding us of what we can do. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, Peter writes, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The word sanctify means set God apart, holy and completely in your life but sanctify the Lord God in your heart. That means you make, you make sure that there's not room for just simple regret or simple sorrow or simple guilt and be ready to give an answer for every man that asks you for the reason that the hope is within you. What's the reason? How is this even possible? Peter is going to later testify. Jesus is going to walk to Calvary. He's going to die a cruel death. But he's also going to come back to life. And when he came back to life, he asked me a question. I don't know what was more shameful. My denial or the shame that I felt when he asked me, do you love me? And Peter's going to respond. And Jesus is going to restore. And this is why all four Gospels record this story. This is why the Holy Spirit devotes so much time and attention to this issue. It's for you. It's so that you would know and that you could know that there's a way back for you. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father. Lord, I pray for that person, that man, that woman who finds himself or herself far, far away from you. They've denied you in the things that they've said and maybe the things that they've done. And Lord, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would awaken in their heart the certainty that you're willing to take them back. That Lord, you love them. That you're not looking for a reason to keep them away, but you're looking for a reason to draw them near. That you're not far away from those who are crushed and broken in spirit, but that you're near. And so, Lord, I pray for that man and that woman who 
have experienced a great setback, a great failure, a great disappointment. Lord, I pray that even now, that in the quietness of their own heart, they would pray that simple prayer, Lord, I do love you and I want to be with you and I want to walk with you in humility and simplicity. Lord, I don't want to walk away from you. Lord, there's no life apart from you. There's no love apart from you. There's no forgiveness apart from you. There is no future apart from you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would awaken their heart, that you would remind them of your love, that, Lord, they would sense your presence and your willingness to love them and forgive them and restore them. And if that's you, if that's your prayer, pray that, say that, mean that, return to friendship and fellowship and relationship with the Lord. Love him, serve him. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.